This lecture is going to be about properties of common forces that are going to reappear again and again and again, and that you're going to use for problem solving in this unit and in future units. I'm just going to start and go through the definition and properties of each force. The first force we're going to talk about is the force of gravity. This is created between any two objects with mass, and the more mass, the more gravitational force is present. The largest mass near us is the Earth, so we feel its gravity most strongly. And the force of gravity on Earth always points straight down toward the center of the Earth. And the force of gravity on an object is also called its weight. Weight is equal to mass multiplied by the acceleration of gravity. So let's say that we have this apple with a mass of 0.4 kilograms. The equation for weight is equal to mass times lowercase g, which if you remember from previous problem solving is equal to 9.8. So I would find that the weight is equal to 3.92 newtons of force. And the weight always points down. The force is a vector. So I draw it as a vector on this object, 3.92 newtons pointing straight down. So so gravity is going to be present in basically all of the problems that we do in this class, almost all of them anyway, because almost all of them take place on Earth or on another planet, and gravity is always present there pulling straight down. So if this is 5 kilograms, we know for a fact that one of the forces on it is the weight, which is just equal to 5 times 9.8, which is equal to 49 newtons. This is a common misconception. Um, if an object is on a ramp, a lot of students will mistakenly draw the gravity like this, pointing straight into the ramp, but that is not correct. The force of gravity always points straight down like that. That is going to become extremely relevant in a few days. For now, you just have to remember, even on a ramp like this, the force of gravity points straight down. Next up, we have the normal force. This is the force created by a surface to oppose a force pushing on it. The word normal in math means at a 90 degree angle to, and the normal force has its name because it always acts at a 90 degree angle to the surface that is creating it. The normal force always perfectly matches whatever net force is pushing the object into the surface. So basically, when you hear the word normal force, I want you to think the force created by a surface to stop the object from falling through the surface. So if this box is resting on the ground, we know that it has a force of gravity pulling it down of 98 newtons based on the previous definition, but it doesn't fall through the ground. That means that there must be some other force pushing it up, and this we call the normal force, the force that the ground is putting up on the box to support it. And the normal force always perfectly matches whatever net force is pushing the object into the surface. And you'll notice that it's at a 90 degree angle to the ground, so that's why we call it the normal force, and it's also 98 newtons to match the force of gravity. If I were to push down on this box and give it an additional force into the ground, the ground would actually push back up with exactly as much force to balance out the total force going down. So if I add in an additional 102 newtons with my hand, plus the 98 newtons of the box's weight, the ground automatically knows to push back up with 200 newtons of normal force to perfectly balance out the forces and make the total equal to zero. And if I were to pull up on the box to kind of assist the ground, the ground would kind of know that it didn't have to apply that extra 40 newtons to keep the box in one place, and so it's actually going to decrease by 40 newtons, and the normal force would now be 58. So it's really just whatever force it takes to stop the object from falling through the surface once all the other forces on the object are accounted for. The normal force doesn't just point up and down. If you're pushing on a surface sideways, the surface is going to give you the exact same amount of force back in the other direction that you're putting on it, and that is also an example of the normal force, because again, it's at a 90 degree angle to the surface, and it's created by the surface. The next type of force we're going to talk about is the force of friction that's symbolized as F lowercase f. That's the force created by a surface on an object that opposes the object's motion. Friction always acts parallel to the surface and in the opposite direction of the object's motion. Its strength depends on the material of the surface and the object itself. There are two types of friction that we're going to go much more deep into in a future video. Static friction, which prevents an object from moving and balances out forces acting parallel to the surface, and kinetic friction, which acts against a moving object's velocity and always points opposite to the velocity. So as an example, if you give this box a push and the box does not move, that's an example of static friction pushing you back. And even if you begin to move, that box will still have the force of kinetic friction on it. But we're going to talk about that more in future videos. If a box is standing still on a ramp, that's probably because the force of friction is preventing it from sliding down. Next we have the applied force. This is the simplest type of force. It's just the force of a push or pull from a person or another object. So if you put a force on this box, we would consider that to be the applied force, or F lowercase a. And if this billiard ball hits another billiard ball, it applies a force on it, so we would call that the applied force as well. Next up is the force of tension. This is the force created by the pull of a rope or string. Tension always pulls in the exact direction of the rope or string itself. And this is super important. This is going to be really important for problem solving. Tension pulls with equal force and opposite direction on both ends of the rope. 
Here's an example of how we could solve problems with that. If we had this 10 kilogram box hanging down, we can see that it would have a 98 Newton force of gravity using our equation. And if it's not moving, that would mean that there has to be some other force supporting it of 98 Newtons, which we can see is coming from the rope. And if the rope is pulling up with 98 Newtons on that side, on the other side it must be pulling down with 98 Newtons. So that top box must be supporting the bottom one with 98 Newtons of force. So if you pull on the rope, then the rope pulls back on you with this much force, and the other end of the rope pulls on whatever object you're pulling on with that same amount of force. So that's how you communicate your force through the rope. You cause it to put a force on you on one side, and it puts that exact same force on another object on the other side of the rope. Next up is the spring force, which we'll talk about more later. This is just the force exerted on an object by a spring. The more the spring is stretched or compressed, the more force acts on the object. A spring does not apply any force if it is at its natural length, which means it is not stretched or compressed. The force of air resistance happens when an object is moving through air. The air applies a force in the opposite direction. For example, when you stick your hand out the window of a moving car, you can feel the force of air pushing against it. An object experiences more air resistance if it is moving faster or if it has more surface area. A falling object reaches terminal velocity, or its maximum velocity, when the force of air resistance up equals the force of gravity down. So as you can see, as this object is falling through the air due to the force of gravity, it's getting faster and faster and faster, and as a result, its velocity is getting bigger bigger and bigger and bigger. And while its velocity gets bigger, the force of air resistance in the other direction gets bigger because the faster you move through the air, the more air pushes back on you. So here, air is pushing back up on the object until it perfectly balances out the force of gravity, and at that moment the object stops accelerating and it hits terminal velocity. So we call terminal velocity the point where the air resistance balances out the force of gravity to stop the object from accelerating. It's still moving, but that's its maximum velocity it can reach. Parachutes employ air resistance to slow the object down and prevent them from having a very high terminal velocity. When you're driving in your car, a lot of times the only two forces to the left and right are a small applied force from the engine and air resistance pushing back against it. As long as you can push back against the air resistance of your car, that's basically all that you need to keep it going. So those are some common types of forces and their basic properties. We're going to be using these to solve a lot of problems and you're going to get very familiar with them, much more through solving problems with them than this video, but this is a good intro just to give you the basic info that you can use to begin to learn and solve problems.